We'll get started here. My name is Mike Majorco. I'm part of the Gusmer Enterprises product management team. And I'm happy to introduce to you uh, Simon Turner from Pure Malt Products, uh, joining us from Haddington, East Lothian, Scotland, to give us a little bit of a presentation and then a demo on Pure Malt Products and how to use them in your brewery. So uh, we will try to hold off on answering all the questions until the end of the presentation, and we'll do our best to keep track of them. But if we get to the end and we've missed yours, please don't hesitate to ask again. Uh, I will go on mute now and I will pass it off to Simon. Thanks everybody for showing up. Hey, thanks Mike and, and hi to everyone. Thank you all for, uh, for joining, um, well, this evening for me and uh, lunchtime or mid-morning for you guys over there. Um, it's gonna be a, a short webinar and, uh, and I will try and keep it short, sweet and relevant. Uh, the plan today um, is to give you a brief introduction to Pure Malt, um, what we do, um, how we do it and, and why we do it. Uh, we'll then go on to a, a quick look at the, the crafted range, which is the range of products which are already available in the US, um, distributed by uh, our partner Gusmer, um, uh, who are obviously kindly hosting this webinar uh, today. And I'll then go on to do um, a very rough and ready uh, demonstration here from my, my desk. Um, of course, it's not the same as um, seeing and smelling and tasting the products um, uh, firsthand, uh, but it may uh, go some of the way to show you how easy it is to, um, to, to use the products um, and also how instant the, uh, the innovation process can be with these uh, specialty malt concentrates. Um, uh, as Mike said, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Uh, we'll probably um, set aside some time at the end to, to go through any, any queries or questions you may have. So um, without further ado, I will uh, crack on. So <clears throat> uh, Pure Malt, we're, we're based, as Mike said, in Haddington, uh, Scotland, um, which is about uh, 20 miles east of the capital Edinburgh. Uh, we're in a county called East Lothian, which is uh, some great agricultural land. Uh, largely flat, apart from the massive hill you see in the middle of your screen there. Uh, really nice fertile soil um, and renowned for, for the quality of the, the crops that we have here. Wheat, spring barley, winter barley. Um, so yeah, great location uh, when it comes to sourcing our raw material. Um, we're uh, an independent family business. Uh, there are three of us involved still. Uh, my uncle, uh, Bruce, um, my cousin and, uh, and myself. Um, so we're second generation. My dad is now happily retired and uh, busy playing golf, but he's getting on a bit. So, uh, so that's fair enough. We'll give him, give him a break. Um, and our team is uh, currently at 100. Uh, we have quite a heavy emphasis on the engineering side. Um, my uncle's definitely a bit of a um, sort of the, the wacky inventor type. Uh, and in the past, I'm, I'm pleased to say that now we are really sort of up in, in the 21st century with, uh, with regards to our equipment. But in the past, it's been a case of um, adapting and adopting uh, bits of different processes to make it work for our niche. Um, so we do have quite a, a heavy in-house engineering um, and an electrical uh, resource, which is great because we can, uh, as I say, we, we found our niche and we have um, good guys on hand that can help us um, keep the plant running smoothly. So as I mentioned already, we source all of our raw material from the UK. And in fact, in recent times, we've, we've signed a long-term agreement with our principal malt supplier, who is Simpsons, who I'm sure some of you will be uh, familiar with. Uh, but their uh, principal maltings is um, about 25 miles south of where we are, just over the, the border in England, the wrong side of the border. Um, but um, as I say, we signed a long-term agreement with them. Uh, the main reason being that we wanted to uh, secure uh, our supply chain, both from a volume and a, and a pricing volatility um, aspect. Um, the good news is that we now source probably in the region of 80% of our raw material from three, uh, three growers, three farms in East Lothian itself. So that's um, fantastic for, for, for us from a provenance point of view um, and great to, to be able to see the crops growing in the field. The site that we occupy in Haddington is really old. Um, it's um, over 800 years uh, of processing cereal uh, in one form or another. And I'll show you on the next slide here just what that looks like. Um, there is a, a very old mill on site which dates back to the 1100s. And this was uh, used uh, to produce very uh, basic gruels and oatmeals, um, essentially just a rich source of starch for feeding the local community. Um, and uh, we're proud to say that the site has been used for cereal processing over the 800 years 
um, obviously moving through various uh, different types of wheat processing um, uh, and malt extracts in their very basic form. Uh, and then when, when the Turner family, our family took over the site in the late seventies, um, we also tried our hand at a few different things. Um, we, we malted for a while. We've got an old floor maltings on site, which you'll see shortly. Um, we were producing malt um, primarily for uh, the, the whiskey dist distilleries in Scotland. Um, and then um, that was in the eighties. Following on from them, we kind of found our niche in um, creating specialty malt concentrates. So that the roasts and the crystal malts being our real area of expertise. Um, and alongside that, we've done a lot of development work in um, concentrates for low and no alcohol beer um, and also uh, some malt beverages. Um, but yeah, so that, that's how things have kind of progressed over the, the long uh, 800 year history. So I won't um, bore you with too many pictures, but I'm just trying to give you a bit of context uh, with regards to the site. This is um, the site uh, from the attractive side, I would say, uh, the old uh, mill building here in the bottom left, um, the brew house and all the processing that you'll see in a minute is kind of hidden behind these trees. And this is the old uh, floor maltings here, which is currently covered, covered in scaffolding uh, and is being um, very carefully restored. Um, Unfortunately, not to be used as a maltings anymore. It will um, be our main office premises. So great to um, uh, to move everyone in there uh, if we ever get back to um, that way of operating uh, after after all this is over with the pandemic. So looking, um, I guess, west from the other side, you can see um, that the site has been um, under development for almost oh, 18 months, two years now. Um, you can see the, the maltings here, the four maltings on the left. And our, our gleaming new uh, brew house, number two here, um, which, as I say, has is, is been developed over the last two years. Um, this is a, a shot that was taken, I think, in the, the autumn time. Um, but you can see the lie of the land. This is Edinburgh in this direction, the town of Haddington. We have our, our malt roasters here on the right-hand side where we produce all of our, our um, roasted malt. The original brew house, um, which sits in the back here, uh, we've got our tank farms here. We have uh, six vessels here for uh, storing um, hot liquid. And then um, there's 11 here. Uh, my uncle missed out on the, the 12th one at the auction, but there's 11 tanks here that we used here for um, cold stabilization. Uh, and in the middle here, we have all of the, the downstream processing, processing the evaporation, uh, filtration, uh, and the filling lines. This little section here has now been developed into, into a warehouse. So everything is contained within the, the one site. So we do get the odd day of, of sunshine in, uh, in Scotland. And this is a glorious day uh, sometime in the summer. Um, and this is uh, looking out over the, the other way. So you see some of the lovely green luscious farmland that we have uh, on the doorstep and, um, and are all singing, all dancing new. Uh, this is a, a five ton um, Mura mash filter brew house. Um, so you can see these are these are the silos. This this brew house will be designated as the roast uh, roast malt brew house. So the roast malt will be conveyed in from the left hand side here into these uh, roast malt silos, um, and the original brew house will be um, left solely for pale and crystal malts. Um, so uh, great to be able to um, uh, well in terms of efficiencies of production, it's, it's a good move for us, and obviously um, serious um, increase in capacity. Uh, which uh, which is great. Uh, just the, the the very last bit on the development. This this um, bottom right hand corner is our new uh, warehouse facility, which is still empty at present as we um, begin to go back on site. But essentially, it is one large cube or block of racking, which will enable us to store a lot of finished good goods and then reduce our lead times, which I'm sure Mike will be uh, be happy about. Um, so a lot of investment, not the best of timing with everything that's happened in the last six months, but I'm pleased to say that there's a hell of a lot of demand for natural um, uh, products and clean label ingredients. So um, we're pretty hopeful that as we do regain some kind of normality, things will be um, picking up fairly quickly. So uh, just moving on now to um, uh, the production process and raw materials. Um, here you can see that we do have um, three principal raw materials. Uh, there's actually four. We have two crystal malts and we have a caramel malt and a crystal 400. We, we buy the pale and the crystal and we use the pale malt to produce our own roasted malt. 
So uh, I think it was six years ago now we installed those, those malt roasters that you saw in, the, in one of the pics um, a few slides back. And that was really a decision that we made when um, US craft had been booming for a while and we were competing against you guys to buy our roasted malt. And we were suffering from a lot of um, uh, pricing volatility and also the quality was becoming a bit more variable. Um, so it was a significant investment for us at the time, um, but we haven't really looked back since and it's given us great um, control over our yield and the colors and the quality. So um, a good move for us. Uh, and as I say, that the pale and the crystal going through one brew house, the roast will be going through the new brew house, which is due to commission uh, next month. So a really brief overview of the production process. Um, essentially, the front end, which you'll see on the on the left hand side here, is uh, by and large very similar to a, a standard brewery, standard brew house. Um, essentially, what we're doing, though, is we're kind of it's adjunct brewing in the sense that our grist is 100% specialty malt so we're uh, mashing with 100 roasted malt or 100 crystal 400 or caramel malt um so obviously we we have to, to tweak certain uh, ratios and, and and mash stands um, but we are milling the grain uh, mashing in with our grist before um separating the work using the mirror mash filter um, we also go through um standard work boiling and, and whirlpool as you would expect um, and from that point i guess uh, it's kind of things change um, the bottom two uh, lines there that you'll see um, are probably, you can ignore just now, they're, they're slightly um, simpler methods of production that enable us to produce um, liquids and powders for, for food products. So obviously the, the big demand for clean label color and flavor, um, slightly more stripped back processes when it comes to producing liquids and powders that are suitable for food applications. On the brewing side, uh, we have to go through um, various uh, steps of refinement, um, not least starting with um, a fairly uh, long process of cold stabilization. It's worth adding that for all the beer concentrates, we do add hops in the kettle um, and we expose the, um, the work to yeast in this cold stabilization phase. To be brutally honest, the, the hops serves more of a, of a uh, process aid in the kettle. It helps us preventing boil over. Um, and the yeast here is a token nod um, uh, to the yeast. It, uh, any alcohol that is created is, is A, very little, and B, is removed during evaporation. But by adding the hops and the yeast, it does enable us to um, uh, confine with, um, or what's the word, yeah, confine with, uh, with purity laws, uh, and we end up with a product that has the four main ingredients of beer, obviously, with water, malt, hops, and yeast. Um, so hops in the kettle, yeast at this, during this cold stabilization. Uh, we then centrifuge uh, the liquid um, and we go through um, various uh, steps of filtration. This is shown as a tiny filter element here on the, on the, on the diagram. Uh, but in fact, this is probably where most of our IP and our, um, what we like to dub the clever stuff kind of happens. Um, and we tend not to share too much information on this because it's really where our, we found our niche. Uh, but in these, um, these filtration um, steps, we can have a very tight control over flavor and color. The result being um, a diverse range of products, some that combine both flavor and color, some that are very much more focused on color with minimal flavor impact, uh, and some that are designed to um, be uh, centering on uh, body, mouthfeel, and foam. So it's the, the kind of novel uh, adoption of fairly regular techniques that enables us to, um, uh, to create a point of difference. Our filtered liquid is then uh, moved on to evaporation. Now, everything that we do is, is, is concentrated syrup. Um, and uh, when it's coming through this stage is between 15 and 20 bricks or percentage solids. We need to evaporate it down to um, anything between 40 and 65 uh, bricks. Uh, and we do this using um, vacuum evaporation. Now, obviously, if water is boiling at 100 degrees, uh, when we um, introduce the vacuum, um, we lower the boiling temperature of the water, meaning that we're able to boil off the water at between 45 and 55 degrees, depending on the product. So essentially, that enables us to have a really gentle evaporation process. It prevents any heat stress on the product. You're not going to develop any undesirable cooked uh, flavors. Uh, so you end up with a liquid which is really true to the raw material um, really clean uh, in terms of, uh, as I say, delivering the, 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 the characteristics from the raw material. 
So we've evaporated our liquid um, up to uh, 45 to 65 bricks, uh, and we then put it through pasteurization um, before filling aseptically into um, irradiated packaging. Uh, the vast majority of our packaging centers on bag and box technology. So that kind of foil liner inside a, a cardboard outer. Um, so yeah, that's a, a very brief overview of the, of the production process of these specialty malt concentrates. So um, that gives us, as I say, a fairly diverse range of products. Um, they're traditionally brewed, um, specialty malt concentrates, um, and they support a clean label declaration in that they are made um, of just malt, water, hops, and yeast. Um, you can see here on the right hand side, and I'll go into these in a bit more detail in just a minute, and um, that we sort of range from the pale malt concentrates through um, the amber, crystal, um, caramel malts, and then we have quite an extensive range of, of roasted products, all uh, imparting slightly different flavor and, and color attributes. So with this range of products, we, we support three main application areas. Um, there, there is brand creation, which I'm going to talk, uh, talk about in a bit more detail um, today. Um, so brand creation through late stage addition. So it sounds like a lot of um, jumbled up words, but what we're saying here is the concept of taking a base beer, a base lager or a pale ale, and adding these specialty malt concentrates late on in the process to create um, a, a different um, product, essentially a new brand or a new beer style. We also um, produce products uh, for um, fine adjustments, a color adjustment, um, clean label color adjustment. Um, obviously, uh, Brewer's Caramel has, has been a popular uh, product for, um, for adjusting color in a beer. Um, we're offering here sort of natural clean label alternatives to, to caramel. And the third application, um, which is obviously a, a very, a very much a growing trend just now, is um, uh, non-alcoholic and, and low alcohol beers. And we produce products that can um, help uh, enhance and restore a body, mouthfeel and foam in some of these uh, lighter lagers and, and, and ales uh, and obviously the, the zero alcohol beers. So uh, moving on now to talk a little bit about uh, the range of products that are available um, currently in the US. Um, about two years ago, we launched uh, the Crafted range. Um, and the whole idea with this range is that we wanted to make the products much more um, accessible to, to craft brewers. Uh, we took on board feedback um, from, uh, from the craft brewers that we've been supplying for many years. Um, and we wanted to offer some key benefits in the form of this, this Crafted range. Again, I'll go on to discuss these in the next slide. So what we did is, is we selected six uh, products from our core range, and, and there were six products that we felt were the most interesting for the craft brewers in terms of color, flavor, uh, and functionality. So starting with the, the lightest product, we, we, we brought in Maitland Pale, um, which uh, as the name suggests is a pale malt concentrate. The idea with this product is that it delivers that clean base malt profile, um, and it's a great option for uh, boosting body, mouthfeel, and increasing foam in some of the, your, your lighter lagers. Um, again, in no and low alcohol beers, this is a, a great product um, as, a, as a base constituent. Um, we brought across the, the CB30, which we, we rebrand as Aitchison's Caramel. Uh, now this is 100% caramel concentrate. Um, so you've got that lovely golden uh, color uh, coming from the, the, the caramel malt, um, along with obviously sweet caramel and toffee notes. Um, and it's a, a great product for um, boosting body mouthfeel and color in some of your premium pilsners, um, pale ales, uh, and box. The, the Countess Crystal is an interesting product. It's actually a blend of caramel malt and crystal malt. So you get a really nice balance uh, between the sweetness of the caramel malt and the slightly drier caramelized notes of the crystal malt. Uh, and with that, you're also getting um, that striking amber red tone um, uh, which is great for, again, box, reds, um, sort of Vienna style lagers, a really versatile product. Uh, moving into the roast products at the top here, we have Montgomery chocolate, which as the name suggests is um, delivering that roast, um, that smooth roast chocolate profile. Um, it's probably our most flavorsome roast product um, and therefore a best suited to creating stouts and porters, any dark ales with, uh, with lots of character. The, the Hogarth Roast also has its place, but, but probably more as, as, a, as a coloring function. Um, it's a good product for using in the brew house, particularly in the kettle, um, just for, for boosting work color. It's kind of mid-range 
color on our scale, it's about 13,000 EBC in its concentrated form. Um, and it's got a fairly mild roast flavor. So it's kind of, it sits in between the, um, the Bruce's Black and the Montgomery chocolate. And the Bruce's Black, um, named after my uncle, and that's him there with a very dodgy picture and his mustache from the 80s. But Bruce's Black is our darkest um, uh, roast malt concentrate. It's 17,000 EBC color in its concentrated form. And it's designed to have very low flavor impact. Uh, so again, a good option for um, uh, just tweaking the color, but primarily in, we selected it for the crafted range because um, it's a great option for creating um, black IPAs and black lagers where you really want to have that, um, uh, that visual impression through really dark color, but without carrying over um, a lot of those uh, roasted flavors. Uh, so that's again, harping back to our kind of novel um, adoption of, of um, filtration techniques. We're controlling the flavor and the color with that one. So it's all about the color with very minimal flavor impact. So that's the, the range, the, the crafted products. Um, and when I was talking about the benefits that we're trying to bring, we're trying to make them more accessible to craft brewers. We made this range available in, in smaller packaging. So we've got five, five kilogram packs. Um, previously, our smallest uh, box was 20, 20 kilograms. And then the feedback that we had from the market was that, you know, I was getting a lot of wastage or it was quite cumbersome, difficult to handle. Um, so with these five kg packs, the idea is that they're much easier to use, um, uh, to store and to refrigerate. Um, same 12 month shelf life as our standard range. And again, that's from filling aseptically into these um, irradiated liners. Um, so once you've opened that pack, uh, you've got one week to, to use it if you're storing it. So the ambient temperatures, but if you're keeping it in your cold store, your cold room, uh, you've got four weeks after opening. Um, and just as a reference, at a typical addition rate of sort of around 1%, um, that five kilogram pack is going to give you uh, sort of 500 litres of beer. Um, so um, as I said, these are currently available through, through Gusmer, um, and we're, we're really delighted to be able to bring uh, what we feel is a much more accessible, suitable product for the, for the craft sector. Um, okay, so um, we're powering on and I was just going to talk very briefly about uh, the concept of brand creation. Um, so the idea here is that these products can be used um, uh, to innovate or as we say reinvent an existing beer and, and you can do this by adding them very late on in the process. So yes, you can add these, um, uh, these products at various stages. As I said, in the brew house, you can add them during fermentation where you develop some of these lovely ester profiles inherent in the malt. Um, but they are designed to be used, uh, as I say, very late on to bright beer tank, even in keg. Uh, and it enables great uh, versatility. Um, and, and especially at the moment where, where I guess um, everyone's under pressure, we're all in the same boat um, with, with obviously consumer expectations still being high. Um, but we are um, trying to ramp up production and then having a halt. So certainly in the UK, we've just had further restrictions imposed, uh, imposed this evening. So times are difficult and, and we're all looking to try and improve efficiencies and, and, and maintain flexibility and give the consumers what they're looking for. So with this concept, you can have, and this is what we're trying to show on the right-hand side here with this, this diagram, the idea of your, your base lager or your base pale ale, and then using these speciality concentrates you can, as I say, add them late on in the process and create a diverse range of colors, flavors, and styles. Um, so um, essentially all we're doing is taking the, uh, the specialty malt that you would include in your, in your grist uh, and making it easy to use and easy to add um, late, in, late in the process. So um, as I said, the idea is that we're trying to enable an efficient yet flexible production uh, and as you'll see, as we move on to the, the, the demo that I'm going to do, you can develop new products and brands very quickly using these products. So if you have your, your base lager or pale ale and bottle, you can dose the extracts in uh, to find a really unique um, style. Um, it's something that's you know, just as, as creative and innovative as any of your other products, um, but you can develop it very quickly um, and in a cost-effective way. Um, and we feel that um, just now, as I said, when we're all under pressure, um, these tools can come in quite useful um, as, as we try to maintain the, the, the choice and the selection for the consumer and also keep an eye on our, uh, on our business, on our commercials. 
So, um, so brand creation through late stage edition, and just on this slide here, I've um, tried to show how the products can be um, attributed to, to certain styles. Um, as I said, the Maitland Pale sits really nicely in this space down here with light lagers uh, and no and low alcohol beers. And that again is for bringing forward the, the body, the mouth feel and the foam. It's our, as I said, our clean pale malt concentrate. Uh, the Aitchison's Caramel, um, that, that caramel malt concentrate sits nicely within the premium Pilsner and the Pale Ale category, bringing in that sweetness, those kind of mild toffee notes uh, and the golden, golden color. The Countess Crystal uh, is our blend, blend of caramel and crystal malt, great for, uh, for the, the gold nails, your reds, um, also sort of a Vienna style lager if you like. The Montgomery chocolate, again with more flavor, um, sits nicely within the, the darker ales, the stouts and the porters, bringing through those smooth chocolate roasted notes. Um, the Hogarth roast in the middle here, kind of mid-range color, um, a versatile, um, kind of does what it says in the tin, it says it's, it's a simple roast malt concentrate. And then finally, the Bruce's black, again, highest in color, um, sits nicely in the, in the black IPA or the black lager. We also find it being used quite a lot now for, for premium colors and, and root beers. And I guess that kind of is testament to the fact that it's all about the color with very little flavor impact. Um, so yeah, just trying to, to summarize how the, the products might fit within the, the style range there. So that's pretty much it in terms of the, the presentation. And uh, as I said, I was going to uh, move on to a very crude and rough and ready demonstration. Again, it's not going to give you the full benefit of, of being able to do a sensory evaluation, um, but hopefully it sort of shows the product capabilities and how easy it is to do uh, your own benchtop trial. So um, I think if we can just uh, spotlight my camera, uh, whoever's got the controls, and I'll just prepare uh, some beer here. <coughs> I'm also, this looks very dodgy. I'm going to take my top off, not my top, but my, my gilet. They, they told me the other day that they could see the beer a lot better with a white background. So I've got a white t-shirt on. Uh, move that. <clears throat> okay, but you can see me clearly just now, so that's cool. Okay, so um, here uh, I'm just going to look at uh, three of the products from the, the crafted range. Um, and I'm going to add them to um, a pale um, base lager. Um, they're all going to be added at 1% addition rate. Um, and you're going to see the impact on certainly on the visual and I'll try and describe what we're what we're doing to the base lager here. So uh, I'm going to pour a control here in this first one and we're working with um, about 150 mil samples here. these up as I go along. I've weighed out the, uh, the concentrates in advance, uh, so I'll show you what they look like in their kind of extract form. Put this one on the back. So as I said, starting from, uh, well, it's my left, I guess it'll be your right. This is just a, a pale lager. Uh, it's gonna be our control. Move that away just now. I've weighed out the, the concentrates in these sample cups beforehand. So we're starting here with the Aitchens Caramel. So you can see this is a 65 bricks concentrate, 100% um, caramel malt concentrate, and it's going to bring forward uh, that lovely golden color hue uh, and the sweet caramel and toffee notes inherent in the, in the malt. So you can see how the, the extract is done. This is a 65 bricks. Uh, designed to um, be fairly easy to uh, to use and will dissolve very nicely in your in your beer. What we tend to do with a demonstration like this is we'll pour a little bit of the base beer uh, into the extract just to make a pre-dilution. So I'm just going to agitate the the extract with the beer here and then pour it back into the base. So with the control and then the addition of the Aitchens Caramel, 
So we used 1% um, addition rate here. Uh, so essentially 1.5 grams in 150 ml of beer. Um, and the color increase that we've, we've uh, brought in here is four EBC. So we've taken our pale, and this must be six or seven EBC, up to around 11 or 12 here uh, using the Aitchison's caramel. We're also going to be imparting uh, those sweet caramel toffee nuts. Um, and essentially what we're doing is taking a pale lager to a, a premium Pilsner feel. Uh, so yeah, so that's Aitchison's caramel. Uh, the next one we're looking at here is the, the Countess Crystal. This is that blend of, of caramel and crystal. You can see it's a lot darker in its concentrated form. Uh, again, I'm going to make um, a bit of a pre-dilution here by adding some of the base into the extract. Again, 1% addition, so I've, I've used one, one and a half grams of, uh, of concentrate. And now I'm going to add it back to the base beer. So with this one at 1%, we are adding um, around 23 EBC of color um, and uh, some lovely multi aroma uh, and some complexity with those, I don't see, I don't see any better with those caramel and, and, and crystal notes. Uh, so that's really taken it almost to the, to the, in the direction of a Vienna style lager. Uh, so that's the Countess Crystal. And I'm just gonna top up uh, my last glass here. Uh, so we're now looking at uh, Montgomery chocolate, um, which as I said is our most uh, flavoursome uh, roast malt product designed to be um, full of flavour but smooth at the same time. We don't want to impart too much in the way of astringency, so um, smooth, uh, low roasted chocolate notes. Again, make a bit of a pre-dilution. Adding back uh, to the base. And again, at 1%, 1 1.5 grams in these 150 ml samples, we're adding in the region of 85 EBC. So it's taken it to a pretty uh, dark uh, stout style there. Um, if you were mixing that with a slightly more homogenous mix, you'd find that the foam also looks a little bit unnatural now with very white foam, I can see on camera, but um, you'd get a obviously slightly more a homogenous mix in the brewery and you'd find that the foam was slightly more natural looking color. So as I say, not easy in terms of uh, not being able to, to, to um, smell and taste the products, uh, but it's just um, about trying to show how easy it is to do some rapid prototyping, to take a base beer that you already have uh, and doze in the, the concentrates to get creative and, and um, conduct your own benchtop trials. Um, so that's pretty much it from, from me. Um, as I said, really appreciate you taking the time to join us um, today. Uh, and I guess I'm happy to, uh, to feel any questions that you, you may have. Simon, I wanted to take a quick moment while maybe people are thinking of their questions to point out a few things. Although um, the crafted range that we talked about heavily today in the webinar is in stock in our Fresno warehouse. Um, we certainly do have access to the other broader range of products and the different pack sizes as well. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to point out when we are uh, doing this late stage dilution, um, as I've found in my experimentation with the crafted range of products, uh, there is certainly nothing to limit you to using only one at a time. You can use them in different yeah. ratios and blends to come up with something completely unique. And the other thing I wanted to point out too for everybody on the webinar is that Gusmer Enterprises does have sample kits uh, of the crafted range, six by 100 milliliter bottles that we'd be happy to, uh, to send out to anybody who wants to play around before they commit to one of these uh, five kilo bag and box pack sizes. But it does look like we're starting to get some Q&A, so I'll go back on mute. Yeah, these are the, the sample packs that are available, six bottles in a pack with the, the full range available, and, and as, as Mike said, available to, uh, to do your own rapid prototyping. Yeah, no, thanks Mike for the, the added information there. Very good point, and, and, and we do see, um, uh, more often than not that certainly in the craft sector they're um, combining uh, two or maybe even three products to to bring forward different attributes whether it be sweetness 
body, color. Um, so you can you really can get creative with these with these concentrates. Simon, are you able to see the Q and A question? Uh, yes, I am. Yes, I've got okay. them here. Yeah. So, what level of BU are measuring the final product? Uh, this, in terms of uh, bitterness here, we're. Um, uh, are you talking about in the in the in the concentrates themselves? Then they're, they're not hopped extracts. Um, so, as I said, we we had a fairly nominal amount of hops in the um, in the in the kettle, um, but as I said, it's to um, to support uh, the label declaration with it and having the, the constituent parts of beer. They're not hopped extracts, so you're you're ending up with a with a product um, which doesn't have any additional bitterness. Um, right. What would you recommend? I hope, 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 hopefully that answers the question, I think. I would imagine uh, so. I think the idea is would it contribute any additional bitterness to your beer over, over what you would use? And I think no. you covered that part. It's uh, plus the dilution range is so small, uh, you wouldn't notice it anyway. And it's more, as you're saying, as a process aid to keep from kettle foaming and to be Reinheitsgebot compliant. Correct. That's right. Um, okay, so uh, that was Denise. Thanks, Denise. Uh, Chris, what would you recommend for common NAB application? Should one consider hop extracts or well hops? Um, so, so we actually did a, a webinar um, last week on on zero zero, um, and it's obviously a space that we do a lot of work in. We develop prototypes, not for well, solely well solely for the the purpose of um, showing the capabilities of the product. Uh, and in these prototypes, we we always work with um, with natural hop products, hop extracts. Um, we we use a lot of products from uh, Totally Natural Solutions, um, who's a kind of a, an unofficial partner of ours in the UK. They've got some some really nice natural um, uh, bittering products and also some dry hop aromas that we we work with. Um, so yeah, we we that that's that would be our um, our choice when we're developing non-alcoholic prototypes because they go hand in hand with the use of these um, clean pale malt concentrates for creating non-alcoholic. We do also see I should mention that we we, we can, you can formulate zero zero products using solely malt extracts and hop extracts, um, but we do also see the the, the use of of Zab or Maitland Pale, um, which is blended with um, a dealkalized base to improve the drinkability. So by adding more body mouthfeel and improving the foam. So it is, you know, the, the option to formulate using just the concentrates, but you can also add um, the, the uh, Maitland Pale or Aitzen's Caramel to your existing uh, dealkalized base to improve um, the drinking experience. Do these extracts contain fermentable sugars? Um, these um, products um, contain largely long chain sugars um, and at the addition rate that you would use, um, usually in the region of 1%, not much more, the contribution to um, uh, fermentable sugars is negligible. Um, so whether that's uh, you know looking at final ABV, um, you would struggle to, uh, well, you wouldn't have any issues, certainly at the, at the typical addition rates. Um, and yeah, they're, they're not suitable for use as priming sugars either, unless you're chucking a whole load and that'd be fairly um, expensive exercise. So yeah, I wouldn't anticipate any, any issues there. And I think that's uh, Neil's question after, is there a risk of re-fermentation after addition? Again, um, at the addition rates that we're, we're using, uh, you wouldn't anticipate any issues with um, final uh, alcohol. Um, so yeah, and then, uh, or bottle bombs really. There's, I think the point is that the addition rate is so small, and unless you have uh, a larger addition rate in the presence of uh, either enzymes or or a, a diastaticus type yeast in your beer, you should not have an issue. Yeah. Correct. And finally, uh, I think Denise, Denise, another question. If I use this for whiskey, I would not want to have any hot concentrate. Yeah, I would suggest that when you say use this for whiskey as in to color a whiskey, is this what you're talking about, I think? I think important thing to mention here, these, um, these products are not um, best suited to um, high spirit applications. So they sit really comfortably and they're designed specifically for, for beer. Um, so obviously anywhere between well zero and uh, I guess six, seven, eight percent ABV, um, you can push it a bit more. Some of these really um, uh, high alcohol beers, but um, 
when we're talking about spirit applications, so whiskey, um, we tend to experience issues with uh, sedimentation. Um, so although we're always conducting trials for whiskies and we get requests for sort of black vodkas and things like that, it's not where the, the products would sit comfortably. So we're happy with that guys just now as uh, I'm conscious of your time as well. I think we're, what are we, 40, 40 minutes or so. So um, as I say, unless anyone's got any further questions, I'm happy to, to wrap it up here and just say, uh, you know, thanks again uh, to all of you for, for joining and also thanks to, to Gusma for, for hosting the webinar. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I do appreciate your time and for putting this on for all of us who are in attendance. And I think if anybody comes up with any questions later on, they can certainly feel free to either, uh, you know, contact us by way of our website, gusmerenterprises.com, or to uh, go by way of your local uh, Gusmer Enterprises technical sales rep to answer the question. We'll be happy to take care of it. Great stuff. Thanks, Mike. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone.